Welcome to the 21st episode of the TechShift F9 podcast, a podcast dedicated to reinventing your career in the age of technology. And how do we do that? Well, we do it by interviewing some seasoned professionals about their experience and career pivots and progressions and failures and so forth. My name is Maurizio Rafona, your host, and this week I'm so excited to have Michael Waits on the show. Michael is a seasoned banker who's worked at some of the most blue-blooded investment banks in the world, at the height of activity in capital markets, and who's transitioned into media. And he's actually the host of one of the best podcasts out there, the Asia Tech Podcast. Please check it out. Michael is also a teacher at a university in Thailand and mentors young entrepreneurs in the region and is an overall great guy. He's also a bit of an inspiration to me in launching my own podcast. And so let's dive right into the conversation. Why don't we do that? Michael, it's great having you on TSF Night. Thank you for taking the time. It's my complete pleasure. I wouldn't want to do this with anybody else but you, by the way. Oh, I really appreciate it. Oh, wow. That's so sweet. So let's uh, dive into it. Um, let's so do it. I have to say that you are, in truth, one of the people that inspired me to launch this podcast. And I'm nowhere near as good as what you're putting out, which is fantastic. And um, I just wanted you to know that. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Before you, uh, we get into your career in media, I'd love to go back a little bit to the old days of banking. You worked at some of the most prestigious <laughs> investment banks at a time where capital markets were booming. It was great times. Yeah. But what was it like for you as a person to go from being a fresh off college young man to seasoned banker? What traits helped you with your long career in finance? So it's a really good question. And I want to back up, if you don't mind, for a second, because I think that there's a fa there's this thing that I call the fallacy of now, where when people look at you, they kind of expect you to be the thing you are today and that you've been that your whole life. I grew up really poor and I didn't even know that Wall Street existed. And when I was a junior in college, a guy came back, one of the graduates came back and just did a career day thing. And he said, oh, I'm working at Kidder Peabody. I work like 100 hours a week and I make like $50,000 a year. And I'm like, this is definitely for me. <laughs> because, <laughs> uh, But I'm serious about this because poverty was something I didn't want to have to experience ever again. Anyway, it was pretty amazing to be on Wall Street during the time that I was there. I studied Japanese when I was in college. So I was, I was offered an opportunity to go to Japan two years into my career at Morgan Stanley. And it felt like a dream to me, to be fair. And I think the things that, that kept me going were like a deep interest in technology. I mean, a really deep interest in tech. I was the guy, I was the first guy to have a computer on my desk at Morgan Stanley in New York, particularly in my department. And the other thing is just persistence. You don't always have to be the smartest guy or gal in the room, but the one thing you have to be committed to doing is just outworking everybody. And I think that's true across all domains and across all verticals. You don't have to be the smartest but you have to just be committed to outworking people. Is that, is that fair? Oh, totally. And uh, I think I'm proof that I'm definitely not the smartest. And uh, I think the work ethic that we see perhaps a little bit today has changed, right? Um, and again, I don't want to be philosophical here, but uh, you must have Go seen some, some degree of change even in your bank career in banking. And some of that might have helped you with your transition to your next step. Did something... Um, change as you saw the world around you in banking back then? It's, a, again, a really good question. The thing is that the type of person that went into the jobs that where I was working, the kind of guys and gals that wanted to come in and do that, they were always outperformers. And the ones that couldn't outperform when they got onto the trading desk or got onto the IT teams were easily filtered out and very, very quickly. So we had plenty of people that wanted to be traders, right? When I sat on the trading desk at, uh, at Goldman Sachs on the portfolio trading desk, there's a particular guy that I remember interviewed like excessively to be on the desk. And I knew, and I actually recommended to my boss not to hire him because I could just tell his personality wasn't suited for it. It didn't make him a bad guy or a stupid guy or anything like that, but he was just unsuited for it. And about three or four weeks into the job, he literally started crying on the trading desk and he wow. was gone. So it was kind of, yeah, it was kind of self-selecting. So the traits of people, at least that were around me during the time that I was in those roles, was almost always the same. Very aggressive, very hardworking, very persistent, 
and always wanting to like outcompete and outperform everybody else around them. And in a way, I loved it because working there to me was like being on a sports team, right? You wanted to win and everybody there wanted to win. And that was the only type of person that was going to succeed there. And to be fair, I think it's a metaphor for life. If you think about who succeeds, regardless of the domain, it's always somebody who wants to win. That, that's what I think. Let's talk about your transition to media. It does sound a little bit like a big leap from finance. And I'm, does it? Well, to me, it does. I mean, it's, it involves a whole different skill set, a whole different network, a different way of doing business. But uh, I'm keen to hear from you about how you went about understanding how uh, to plan for it. And how did you feel that you did right in this transition? And some of the things perhaps that you would have done differently with uh, hindsight. So at the beginning, this may not make sense, but I think you'll see it kind of coalesce around something that makes a ton of sense. When I was 12 and 13 years old, so this is a while ago, right? There started to be this trend where families would buy video cameras. They were just starting to come out and they were huge, right? Yeah. And they were connecting microphones to them. And this was when I was going to my friends, bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs, yeah? And I wanted the mic. I always did. I just wanted to interview people and talk to people. And I think that throughout my career, I was always waiting for technology to connect up to my vision of what broadcasting should be. So this transition for me was actually pretty easy because I've been thinking about it for 35 years. It's a long time to think about this. When Real Player, which is something probably you've never heard of, oh, I remember. was introduced. Yeah, but when it was introduced, I mean, I had a 56K modem at home, right? And I thought, this is going to make it possible for everybody to have their own television station. I have to participate. But now I can shoot with a 4K camera. I can sit in my own studio. I can film backgrounds. And I can have radio quality microphones in my studio. And then that allows me to build my vision of what a modern media company should look like. And you have to remember that when I was at Morgan Stanley, when I was at Goldman Sachs, when I was at UBS, and when I was in the finance industry, we'd always have these offsites. And I was always the guy at the table who was like, Mike, Michael, you've got to go up on stage and talk about this like impromptu. So I've been doing this my whole life. And I believe three things are true. One is that technology, two is money, so finance, and communication drive everything in the world. And I've been doing it my whole life. So in a way, I don't feel like I've transitioned, right? I just feel like the output has changed, if that makes sense. Oh, it does. Is that okay? Yeah. Oh, I, was, I love the how you connected the dots and having that ability to see the dots. I think it's what differentiates a lot of people in their career, right? Maybe, uh, maybe. So, well, it's amazing. And uh, I love that as part of your podcasts, you do have a special focus on women in tech. From all the conversations you've had and the incredible women in technology you've met over the last few years, is it possible to come up with some characteristics that you see emerging? I do, but before I do that, I want to tell you why we do this. Please. The first guest on my show was a lady. I want to make that clear. And Here's the reason why, and, and I do this on my own podcast, and I'll get to these emerging trends in a second. You're a product, I believe, of, your, um, of, your, of the domain in which you grew up, of your environment, yeah? My grandfather, who was one of the most inspirational people I've ever met, could not read, he could not write, and he could not sign his own name. But he was brilliant, and he ran a very big business. He married a lady who was a mathematician, and an actuary, and she was brilliant. And without her, he couldn't have done 75% of the stuff that he did. And it was obvious to us as his grandchildren how much he literally worshiped this woman. So when we were growing up, we didn't even have to be told that women were important, that they were powerful, and that they were very strong partners. I can't get it out of my system. So when I talk about women in tech, it's not just because diversity and inclusion is a thing. It's because it's been part of my whole life. And I think that's another differentiator for me. I don't follow trends per se. I think I've been very lucky to understand like things that are important and just dig deeply into them. 
But the one trend that I do see, and this was introduced to me back in, I think, 2012 or 2013, I can't remember the exact date, was from Alexis horowitz Burdick, who at the time was the founder of a company called Luxola. And she stood on the stage, I think it was like at a Tech in Asia event, and she was introduced as one of the most prominent female entrepreneurs in Singapore. And she was mad. Rightly so. She really was. She came on stage angry. And I give her tons of credit for this because she stood up to this was more than 10 years ago. And she said, I'm tired of being called the female entrepreneur. I just want to be called an entrepreneur. And if you listen, if you listen to a recording that I released this week, right, with Rhonda Wong, she says the same thing. Yes. I want to grow. I want to have a world where my daughters and my children don't have to say, don't care like what gender they are. They're just appreciated for the things that they do. And I think this is the biggest theme. This is the biggest thing that women tell me when they're on the show. And when I ask them about it, they're like, I don't want to talk about it because I don't think it's relevant and important. I want to be an entrepreneur, full stop. That's amazing you do that, Michael. And I think that approach is something that we are starting to see a little bit more of generally. But uh, you're focusing on uh, entrepreneurs and uh, women in technology in uh, Asia and you know for a big part southeast asia and and recently i worked in vietnam and i saw how diverse the talent is and yeah. that's very promising but are you seeing some positive trends coming out from this region so interestingly i think everything every country is different right i mean i think when the world looks into southeast asia in particular even asia in general they tend to generalize and i think you've probably you probably know this from your experience of living in japan it's not the same so I live in Thailand, and, and I think this is true for Singapore as well, but very different in Japan and probably in Indonesia and Malaysia, yeah? And I'm just going to talk about this sort of gender inclusion. In Thailand, women are insanely strong. Hmm. It, it's not even a question. Like, nobody would ever say female entrepreneur in Thailand because they'd be too afraid that they'd get smacked down. There are plenty of female CEOs. There are plenty of female board directors. Like, it's really strong here. But we're still emerging. And I think the one thing we do see is most of the entrepreneurs actually in this region are already wealthy because the economic situation is so bifurcated in most of these countries that only the wealthy have the time or the inclination to be able to say, let me be a little bit more creative, right? Because there's still, there's still this concept of building the middle class. If you're middle class, you can actually change and take risk. But if you're below the middle class, it's hard to take a risk because you're more, you're more just trying to like serve your family. Yeah? Totally. And I think that's one of the biggest differentiators here. Then that's really different, I think. Let's go back a little bit to uh, your work in media. Uh, I'm a big fan. And uh, I can Thank now... You. Appreciate, of course, appreciate a little bit better just how hard it is. But I'd like to hear from you what you think have been the harder aspects of that bit of this business in the media and perhaps some of the things that you weren't quite expecting when you started doing it and perhaps how you handle them. The minutia, I think, is really the hardest part. And I think when people look at television, when they look at movies, they don't think about like what the editor does. You know, they look at the directors and the stars of the movies and they think that's what I want to do. But the real dirty work is in the editing. I didn't even know how to use any of the software that was necessary to edit a podcast. I didn't understand microphones. I didn't understand why people wore headphones. I didn't understand monitoring, which is listening to yourself actually record, right? We went through this before we started this recording today. I can have my microphone here and address it properly. Or I can have it over here sounds completely different. I once sat in my bedroom with my laptop on my bed to use it to absorb the sound, right? Using my headphones from my iPhone to record a podcast. <laughs> I'm laughing because it sounded so bad. But I think the most important thing that I learned is that the details matter and that if you want to produce a great podcast, you have to start with the sound. Because in the first two or three minutes of your show, whatever show you're doing, if your sound is not good, people won't listen. And I spent a ton of time doing research on like the proper microphones and the proper digital audio interfaces as well to understand how to use those at the beginning. 
and also on the back end to understand how to edit properly and produce it properly. And that took a long time to do. And I think if you go back and listen to some of the earliest shows that I did, they sound terrible. The new ones sound great. But another important factor here is just doing research and being prepared, right? Like you want your guests to feel like they're the most important thing in your life on the day that they record, right? So we do very specific things to make them feel that way. Some of them are very subtle. The other thing that I try to do is I try to make the guests forget that they're recording, right? So what I don't do, and I think this is actually really important, I learned this along the way as well, is that I don't want to interview people at all because I don't think it makes compelling content. What I really want to do is I want to make people feel like they're eavesdropping on a private conversation. I'm super interested in, in you. When I have a guest on, I don't have them on for any other reason except that I'm super interested in what they're doing and why they're doing it. Right. And I think the, the other thing that I found really challenging at the beginning was to be able to give the guest exposure and to find a way to have the listeners connect with the guests. And one of the things I like to joke about is to say, humans make visceral connections with other humans, right? Not with businesses. And if I can get my listeners to connect with the guests, in a way, it doesn't matter what they do. And I, I, the joke I make is, if they don't connect to you, you could be giving away free Bitcoin and they wouldn't care. But if they do connect with you, you could be running a business that like just walks dogs and they'll think it's the greatest thing in the world. But I think all of those things have been challenges along the way. The other thing as well is that you always have to change. You have to learn and you have to grow. And it's not just about the tech. It's about the way you tell stories and being comfortable with the way you tell those stories and understanding how storytelling actually works. All of that's been hard, but we keep growing and we keep trying. Just by that, it, it's clear to me that you had to work a lot on, I mean, I call it risk killing, but it isn't. It's really learning new things and yeah. and having perspective of what works and what doesn't work. And how much of your time do you spend on, on that? I mean, how do you manage your your journey into getting all that new information and looking at what's out there that can help you uh, streamline some of your production or perhaps come up with different themes and ideas. Cause I, I feel that one, one thing I didn't like in finance, for example, was that we were so laser focused on our business that right. it felt like you were living just for that. And you were not really paying attention to what's going on, but in the world of technology, it's all about keeping your head above you know, the sea level and seeing what, what's coming, what wave is coming. I, mean, I know it's a very generic question, but how'd you go about that? Uh, again, you have to back up and understand that, like, I love what I do. I don't feel like I'm working. I really don't. And I was explaining this to somebody actually yesterday. I've never been this happy in my whole life because I get to do the things that I love to do. I get to talk to amazing people. And I mean this like you. And every day that I get to do that, I get to learn something. So this idea of like upskilling and reskilling, I, I believe it's actually really important. But if you do it in the context of stuff you love, it doesn't feel like you're working. So it's strange to me, right? Because like when I was in Morgan and Goldman, on a Friday night, everybody would say, have a great weekend. I understood what the weekend meant. Yesterday, I thought it was Saturday. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I was having dinner with a friend of mine last night and I was like, it feels like a Saturday for some reason, but it was a Thursday. And I think the point is that when you do the stuff you love, the learning is automatic and you just go do it. Like, I don't, again, I don't feel like I'm working now, but I love having these conversations because it makes me think in a way that I don't normally have to do. Right, because I get to really focus on the stuff that I love. And I think that that's the most important lesson that I've learned in this journey of trying to build something that I care about. And I think it's important actually to understand like what we're trying to build as well, because I, I don't think it's obvious yet. We already have the largest podcast network in Asia. Like I don't say this a lot, but you probably know this. The Asia Tech Podcast, which is my flagship show, has listeners in 173 countries. And it's amazing. Yeah, that's insane. But it's, it's, and it's taken a lot of work to get there. But I want to ask you this. You've heard of all the big media companies in the United States, whether it's CNN or Disney or Fox, you've heard of all of them. 
you've heard of all the big media companies in Europe, whether it's Berta Media or the BC, or the, you know, the British Broadcasting Company. You've heard of them as well. And you've heard of Al Jazeera from the Middle East. And if we were in any country in the world and we brought up any of those companies, everybody would know them. Is that fair? Yeah, totally fair. What's the one in Asia where if you were in London or if you were in Milan or if you were in Germany or if you were in California, you said, I listened or I watched or I read this thing in what in Asia that everybody would know. They'd be like, oh, yeah, I've heard of that, but I didn't read it. What would that company be? To be honest, in terms of legacy media, there wouldn't be one. It doesn't exist, right? That's what we're built. Does, I think the NHK tried. No, 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 but it didn't. But but again, NHK, it's in the name. Nihon <laughs> Broadcasting. Right. What is it? Hoso Kabushiki Gaisha. Yes. Yeah. So no one knows that. Even the people that know you don't know NHK, and you've been in Japan for years. My point is that that doesn't exist, and that's what we're trying to build. Okay, so the podcasting for me is the low-hanging fruit because that's something that I can do and I can do on my own. But as we progress, we're trying to build this really influential Asian-based media company that has influence all over the world. And all of the things that you've mentioned during this recording are building into that goal. That's what we're trying to do. It's amazing. And uh, But sticking with a little bit with the theme of podcasting, it's now, is this something... Go ahead is a sandbox I'm getting to play in. Um, yeah. And the fact that, as I've been reminded recently, actually, by uh, an acquaintance of mine, when I told him it was podcasting, he was like, yeah, well, so uh, you and the rest of the world, I'm like, yeah, well, anyone and their cousin is trying to launch a podcast these days. And But, you know, beside that element, but how do you see technology impacting what we're doing or what, you know, the professionals like yourselves are doing in podcasting and how is, is it making it any better? Is the arrival of AI potentially taking over content creation and production, positive and negative? Or, I mean, how, how do you feel that can actually use and support your narrative, what you're trying to build? So technology is an enabler. It's it, in a way, again, you reach a certain age where you understand that like everything in the world is cyclical. You can go back a hundred years and, and say there were 54 car companies in the United States when automobiles first started being developed. Everybody wanted to be in the automobile business the same way that everybody wants to be in the media business today. But it's hard work, right? And adapting to all the changes in technology, even in the car business back in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s in the US meant that at the end of the day, there were only like five. And now in the US, maybe there are three. And the only people that could survive were the people that could adapt to like the new changes in technology and distribution and understanding marketing and sales. And I think it's the same thing in the podcasting business. To me, artificial intelligence, if you want to talk about that, because it's a big topic today, is an enabler. Can you use it for editing? It's not really there yet. I use it to do some of my transcripting, but it's pretty bad. It's actually really bad. And I pay for it. I want it to be better but it's not great. We talked about the episode that I, that I produced with Rhonda Wong, but the previous one was with a guy named Jay Tai, and he's the chief operating officer at something called Echo MR, Market Research. And one of the things he said to me during that recording was, people that know how to use artificial intelligence are going to take your job. The AI is not going to take your job. Not yet. We're not there yet. And again, for a guy like I am, who's always been the guy that's taken technology to make whatever I was doing more productive, at least today in the, in the realm of what I do, I'm not afraid of tech. I think if you use it in a way that makes you more productive, you're going to be much better at it. I mean, I've had, I've had years where I produced 250 to 260 podcasts. That's over five or six different shows. I love using tech to do this. And I think it's the only way to enable things at scale. Is that fair? Completely agree. Uh, Michael, I really appreciate your time. One last question for you. What should we expect from you going forward? What's in store for Michael Wade's over the next few years? I mean, we already talked about it. What we're trying to do is, I believe that every company should be their own media company. I don't think that they should go on legacy media anymore. And here's the reason why. On legacy media, you get a seven minute block. The guy or the gal that's interviewing you doesn't know anything about your business and doesn't care. They have a producer in their ear that's telling them what to say and respond. The other big problem is you're, you're preceded by some war correspondent and you're followed by like a diaper commercial 
And that means that your message gets lost. What we're trying to do is build a media company that allows you to get your message out. This is the most important thing we do. And I want to say this too. I'll leave you with this final point. The stuff we do is not about me. If you look at the transcripts, we've talked about this already, right? That I produce, it's 70% my guest and 30% me. Most of the people that do what I do, do it for their ego. They want to get their name out there. They want to get their ideas out there. And all I'm trying to do is help people tell their own story. Michael, thank you so much for sharing your experience and insights with us. It's my complete pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, folks, it's been amazing talking to Michael. So much knowledge, so much insights, so much sharing. And I hope it's been helpful for people who are thinking about moving perhaps into a media role and uh, how to approach it, hearing about Michael's own experience and trying to get some uh, pointers and support, perhaps. Well, that's all for this week's episode. Stay cool, stay positive, 